Hi, everybody. Welcome to our uh, Sunday morning, January 31st. We are celebrating uh, today. It is uh, one of the 52 Feasts of the Resurrection. We are in the season of Epiphany, and we are at now the beginning of week number four. So uh, we're really glad to have you with us. And I want to read the introduction that comes at, just so you know, when Teresa provides the bulletins, she is using a subscription service that the church pays for that's called um, Sundays and Seasons. And it's a, a publication of the ELCA and it's based on the lectionaries and they have built up over years now quite a collection of uh, not only the, the lections and the prayer, the colic prayers, but introductions. And then uh, in that website, they provide suggestions for music and for Christian education events and so forth. Uh, so it's really uh, quite a, a good resource and uh, it's formatted in such a way that it makes it easy on uh, the production of bulletins to copy and paste pretty large bodies of already <laughs> spell-checked material. And uh, this week in Epiphany number four, just to remind everybody, and in case you're new with us, the, the season of Epiphany is linked with Advent, Christmas, and Epiphany. They're kind of a coordinated unit. In Epiphany, we are specifically looking at the showing forth, which is what that word means, of Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, as the Messiah of Israel and the Lord of creation. So the question really is, who is this person whose nativity we anticipated and then celebrated and now we're looking at specific examples of how Jesus is made manifest to the world. So grab your coffee and jump in. We have started with the visit of the Zoroastrian priest, the Magi. We looked at Jesus as a 12 year old in the, well, we looked at him in circumcision. We looked at him as a 12 year old in the temple. We looked at him at his baptism. Uh, and we have seen the beginning of the proclamation of the gospel. We're in the year where Mark's gospel is the primary one for the year. And you'll be drawn again and again and again to chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So last week we used Chad Bird's scholarship to look at that word gospel. And we looked at how that word is linked into the Old Testament. And the word evangelium in Greek, it's uh, Hebrew word is the good news and almost always associated with, uh, for example, a military victory. Um, I always remember the picture in the National Geographic book about Greece and Rome. Somebody drew this very realistic uh, painting of uh, a marathon runner uh, showing up and saying, rejoice, we conquered. That's the Evangelium. And that was the uh, marathon was a place north of Athens and this big battle took place there. And all of the army went out from the city and everybody was waiting with bated breath to find out what happened. And this guy ran all the way. And then uh, the story is that he expired, but that giving of that deeply sought for word is evangelion, uh, much more than newsflash. <laughs> so Jesus comes in to the Galilee proclaiming this 
long expected, hungered after word about God is on the move and it's here and it's now. And he's, he's saying it's on you, it's at hand, it's among you and so forth. And Jesus is telling his audience, you need to change your mind about the way that you're living your life and put your trust in what God is doing. I am really struck by the complete inefficiency, ineffectiveness, I'm going to say apostasy of the Christian church in modern America. We don't have the guts to tell our neighbors, our family members, our friends, the people that we claim that we love, that all of this garbage that they're listening to that's just pumped in by the electronic mass media, we don't have the guts to tell them that 99.9% .9 of that is a lie and that God is doing something completely different in the, their life now and into eternity depends on them changing their mindset and putting their trust in Yeshua of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, who is Lord and Christ. So that's the good news and that's where we're going. So today we're in the fourth Sunday and this is going to be Jesus being made manifest by his first miracle as recorded in the Gospel of Mark. Now, just to enhance your Bible study, we have four Gospels, and it so happens that the early church took this stuff so seriously that we have in our possession, available to you, free of charge at the church, a good Luther study Bible for our confirmands, and we have the oldest, most reliable biographical information that exists about Jesus, his teaching, and the gathering of people that put their trust in him and believe the good news and live their lives according to it, starting with Galatians. So that's the oldest known Christian text that we have. We used to think it was First Thessalonians and scholars keep working and working and working in the current consensus by the top scholars like N.T. Wright at Oxford is that Galatians is the oldest. So um, we are looking at uh, these gospel messages and they are, if you will, rather like uh, various artists painting a portrait of an individual. So for example, take an American icon like um, name any president. Uh, uh, for example, Barack Obama's portrait made the news when he left office after eight years, and it was not your standard statesman in a three-piece pinstripe gray wool suit looking all dignified. He's seated. It's rather a casual presentation, but it's a really excellent portrait of the man. It it's not only his likeness, but the artist really tried to pull in with colors and background and so forth, a portrait of the man. So think of these gospels as rather like this. This is Mark, presumably John Mark, who was uh, for a while a traveling and preaching companion of Paul, what we know about him is that he traveled into North Africa to the city of Alexandria and was martyred there. And uh, this is his story. It's the oldest. Be scholars think it's the oldest gospel that we have. And they date it variously from the mid 40s up until about 65, 70. So resurrection happens in 30, 31, 32, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, we think April of 30 is when the resurrection happened, and we may ha very well have with Mark a gospel that's as early as 48. So that's pretty close into the events. Uh, John Mark, there's a little thing in the back of his gospel at the arrest. There's this odd little story that nobody would have included other than the guy that it was about, of this young man that snuck out of the house 
because he wanted to be able to see what was going on. And when Jesus was arrested, uh, one of the guards tried to grab this kid and he was wrapped only in his bed sheets and he ran off into the night into his, with his pajamas or whatever. So with this story of John Mark, we're talking somebody that either was physically present or has interpersonal relationships with people like Peter and so forth. So uh, our text is the first miracle that Mark records in his gospel. Now, in the church year, the first lesson, almost always from the Old Testament, except during the season of Pentecost, where the book of Acts gets a good run, um, is thematically related to the gospel. So here's our introduction. In Deuteronomy, God promises to raise up a prophet like Moses, who will speak, shows people the power of God's work. For the church, these are ways of pointing to the unique authority people sensed in Jesus' actions and words. We encounter that authority in God's word around which we gather, the word that prevails over any lesser spirit that would claim power over us. Um, that word prevails over all and frees us to follow Jesus in this world. So, Let's pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. So, our first reading, thematically related to the gospel, keep that in mind, is from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. The Lord's, this is Moses speaking, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb, on the day of the assembly, when you said, if I hear the voice of the Lord, my God, any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, they are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my word in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die the word of the Lord. So what do we have here? Okay, Deuteronomy. You know, this is kind of a mental checklist. Part of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means the second law. It is a version of the giving of the commandments by Moses that seems to emerge almost as a second tradition, if you will. It is part of a group of, of books entitled uh, by scholars as the Deuteronomistic History. It includes Joshua, Judges, Kings, or I'm sorry, Samuel, Kings, and Jeremiah. I'm not sure if... Um, Lamentations would, would fit in there. It was not in the list when I looked at the uh, some research on this. Um, this notion of the Deuteronomic history uh, as a distinct body of literature was 
developed in the German textual criticism school. The scholar most associated with it is Martin Noth, and he says that the book of Deuteronomy as we have it, particularly chapters 5 through 26, that seems to be the part of Deuteronomy that, uh, if you'll remember the story of King Josiah, uh, when he he came to the throne as a child, there was a regency, and there during his reign, when he was a young man, there was some construction being done at the temple, and when they broke open this one wall to do some renovations, they discovered a copy of the scriptures of the of the Torah, and they brought that and read it to the king, and he was so moved that he realized how far the country had fallen away from following God, and he immediately repented, changed his mind, went in a new direction. He rent his clothes as a sign of grief over what he had just learned, and he called the nation to a great period of revival. So uh, Deuteronomy is in this historical time period, and um, there is a body of literature that includes the books of Joshua about the conquest, Judges about the settling, Samuel about the move to monarchy, Kings about how the kingdom initially was unified under Saul and David and Solomon, and then under Rehoboam, the, the coalition fell apart. The 10 northern tribes went one way, and Judah uh, with Jerusalem as its capital and center with the temple went another way, and uh, northern kingdom got wiped out by Assyria around 721. The southern kingdom gets wiped out <clears throat> by the replacement superpower in the region in the 500s by um, Babylon. And so you get this Deuteronomicistic history. And um, you know, we, we talked about that a little bit before. Some dates to hang things on. 622 BC is Josiah and his reform movement based on Deuteronomy 5 through 26. So I don't want to get into the history again. We did that before. But what we're looking right now is in Deuteronomy, in that core part of the book, um, we're at chapter 18, and Moses is uh, nearing the end of his life, and he is uh, reviewing to make sure that the people have it straight and he's presenting it to them so that um, they will walk in the way of the covenant. And this is part of that speech. He says to them that the, prop, that the Lord is going to raise up a prophet like me from among your own people. Verse 15. As Christians, you will have heard about Jesus as prophet, priest, and king as images that help to explain who he is and what he's about. So this is one of the key texts that talk about Jesus being the prophet that Moses talked about. This is a messianic text, if you will, uh, not in the sense of an anointed son of David. It doesn't say that, but uh, as someone who has the same kind of authority that you see in Moses. Moses is the lawgiver. Um, in the entire uh, covenant history of the people of Israel and so forth, it's really hard to find somebody who's more important uh, or even as important as Moses. So he says to the people, um, this is what you, you need to heed such a prophet and he says that God approves this, and he points back to an event during the Exodus where the people have gathered around Mount Horeb in the Sinai for God giving the covenant through Moses to the people, and they all cleaned themselves, and they refrained from having sex, and they 
you know, put stones around the base of the mountain and anything, any living thing that went on to the mountain was to be killed and so forth. So it's a staged encounter with the living God. And uh, when God spoke, initially God spoke directly to the people of Israel, but his voice was so powerful that they were literally scared to death and they begged Moses to make him stop and that Moses be an intermediary between them and God because it was too much for them. Now, if you remember, this is the people that was languishing in Egypt. Moses and Aaron and Miriam lead this great encounter with uh, God taking on the gods of Egypt and then the Passover and the angel of death and going through the sea. And now they're out in the desert to form as a nation with God giving this covenant and God's too much for them. And they beg for an intermediary. And God says, uh, when the quotes the people who, saying, if I hear the voice of the Lord my God anymore or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then God replied to me, to Moses, they are right in what they say. Verse 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among the people, uh, among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. So this is the role of the prophet. It's really vital that the prophet actually be called and commissioned and sent by Yahweh to the people. And there's a provision here. Anyone who does not heed such a prophet uh, is blowing God off. So it's not Moses or Elisha or Elisha or Jeremiah or Isaiah or Ezekiel as a man that has all this authority, but they are servants of the Lord God who have been given a job. They are a herald. So, for example, if you saw the movie Kenneth Branagh did of Henry V, he sends one of Henry sends one of his uncles as a herald to the king of France, his enemy, to deliver a message. There's a whole protocol about heralds are to be protected and so forth, and they carried a particular flag and. Um, they they were recognized and they had diplomatic immunity, if you will. And they came and their job was to be the mouthpiece of their master. So whatever they were saying to the recipient of the message, it wasn't that individual person, but it was the one who sent them. So with Moses... It's not Moses per se. Moses is handpicked by God and trained by God and sent by God and given a word to say by God. So when you have this intermediary, this herald speaking, you should listen, okay? And if you don't, you're blowing off not this human being. Uh, there are a dime a dozen, but you're blowing off God. Uh, so he says to them in verse 20, but any prophet who speaks in the name of another God or same category who presumes to speak in the name of Yahweh when Yahweh did not command them to speak, in other words, they're making it up, that prophet shall die. Now, of course, for us, that baits the problem of how do you know? And we'll see all about false prophets as lessons unfold. So someone like Jeremiah, who has a call from God, a commission from God, a word to speak from God, when they deliver it and they get to the court, there are other people that say, well, God told me to say, and it's the exact opposite message. And you got to kind of figure out who do I believe? It's not unlike... Well, I'm just going to pick on the ELCA because it's our church. 
we have people who uh, went to seminary and they got a call to a congregation and they were ordained, but that in and of itself does not make them a disciple of Jesus. It does not mean that they read the scriptures with any legitimate understanding whatsoever. And so they kind of make up a theology uh, and they act like they're all smart. And many of them are, you know, I, I know a lot of really uh, socially active, compassionate, highly intelligent people, but what's coming out of their mouths doesn't really dissect the text. It, uh, it's their opinion and they throw a few verses in just because it makes the people feel good. So you've got to know the difference going into a call of who's a legitimate disciple of Jesus Christ, fully committed to him, servant of the word to speak um, versus uh, one time Teresa and I, I was on an assignment from the army and it was going to be about it you know, 15, 16 months. And we knew it was a real short time. So we decided we're just going to go to the, the, the local Lutheran church. And so we went there and there's this really nice guy. He was, you know, very people oriented and all that other kind of stuff. But once you got to know him, we're talking to him. It was like, so why are you doing this? And he goes, well, actually I started doing this to get a student deferment to get out of going to Vietnam. And <laughs> You know, he was well trained. He was, in fact, he was working on his doctorate, but his motivation was not Jesus. It was, if I have a student deferment, I can't go to Vietnam. And the longer I stay a student, the more likely the war will be over and I won't get killed. Okay, so the psalm for today, 111, hallelujah, which means praise God. Uh, L, if you ever see E-L, it's God. Hallelujah. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, total involvement, in the assembly of the upright, in the congregation. Hmm. Uh, what about all these, you know, right now we can't, but when we can, all these people that don't bother. Great are your works, O Lord, pondered by all who delight in them. Majesty and splendor mark your deeds and your righteousness endures forever. Your cause, you cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands are faithfulness and justice. All of your precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. You sent redemption to your people and commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice this have a good understanding. God's praise endures forever. Not a bad prayer, not a bad reflection. All right, our New Testament lesson, the second lesson is 1 Corinthians 8. So 1 Corinthians is written in the early 50s, I'm going to say 54, by St. Paul to a church that he found, you know, he was the founding leader of the church. And he writes, now concerning, he's writing back an answer to a bunch of problems. It's a very volatile congregation. Now concerning food sacrifice to idols. This is a problem for people because there are folks that are just coming out of paganism into Christianity. And for them, these gods are really real. And it's a sacrilege. It's a crossing of boundaries for them to move away from the worship of these gods and then go to the back door of the temple and buy the, the meat that was sacrificed there at the temple. So Paul writes, we know that all of us possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge 
but anyone who loves God is known by him. So what's in your head is not as important as the attitude of your heart. Hence, verse 4, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. So the commandment, that's an intellectual the commandment, says, I am the Lord your God, and there's only one God. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven and on earth, early church often saw these as demons, as in fact, there are many gods and many lords, yet for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom all are all things and for whom we exist. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, the word of God made flesh, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. All right, so this becomes a really important text in Christian ethics. And here's the point. I'm in Christ Jesus. And Luther says this um, in 1520 in his address to the nobility of the German nation, he said to them, you know, we're free in Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross bearing my sins to judgment and to death and to hell. And in his bodily resurrection from the dead, he gives that new life to me. I am now found, redeemed, restored, regenerated, recreated. I am the brother of Jesus the Christ, and I have absolute total freedom. Okay? Second piece that goes along with that is when Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself, love suddenly puts me in a position where um, as a free Lord of the kingdom of heaven, I need to be concerned about my weaker brother. So in this case in Corinth, you had these Christians who were redeemed. And then they thought, you know, uh, the food sacrificed at that temple and the cooks that worked there, it's a great restaurant. That, you went there to eat. And so they kept doing that. But there were people who were just coming to faith that that was part of the worship of these pagan gods. And they were like confused and thrown into a, a confusion that was sinking them. And so what Paul is saying here is a matter of Christian ethics. The commandment of love overrides the reality of liberty, that I have to be worried about what's going on in my weaker brothers and sisters. Where this plays out in the Reformation, for example, we're at a 500th anniversary of this. In April is when Luther went to the Imperial Congress being held in the city of Worms, and he made his famous Here I Stand speech. And Luther uh, then went and hung out. Uh, he was kidnapped, in quotes, by his own duke, Frederick the Wise, and squirreled away in an old dilapidated fortress called the Wartburg. 
And when he came out of the Wartburg, he came out because Wittenberg had turned into this discombobbled mess and the whole Reformation movement was being discredited and they wanted Luther to come back and fix it. So he did. And he blew into town in 1522 and he preached for six nights in a row uh, and they're called the Invocative Sermons. And in it, Luther took this concept and laid out, this is how you go about following the Lord and reforming the church and calling it back to the scriptures and all those kinds of things. But it has to be done in a way that accounts for the people that were born and reared in medieval Catholicism and all of this was new and they didn't understand it. And it was a stumbling block to them. And Luther said, you can't do that. You have to take account of these people. You have to be kind. You have to be loving. You have to spend more time teaching than you think you ought and so forth and be very deliberate and so forth. There was a point in time a few years on when Luther himself said, uh, they're now no longer being the weaker brother, like they don't get what's happening. They are now becoming obstructionists and using this to, to prevent the work of the Holy Spirit. And so he kind of said, all right, we have taught this stuff and we've been very kind and gentle and moving forward. And on such and such a date, we're done. Okay, so... Um, there is a point in time where it's, it's like being the parent of a two-year-old. You want to let the kid work on putting their own jacket on and zipping and, and so forth. But you can tell when your loving patience, helping them to grow and develop, turns into giving tyrannical power to a, a two-year-old, subverting the will of what the family's trying to do. And then you come, kind of come to a point where you go, we'll keep working on that zipper, but right now, zip, you're getting in the car. <laughs> go. And every parent has to face that, and you have to kind of face that in spiritual life as well. So the principle here is love trumps knowledge, and part of being loving is explain teach and so forth. So now we come to the gospel for the day. The acclamation is from another gospel, Matthew 4, 16. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. Those who sat in the shadow of death, light has dawned. So here we are, gospel of Mark, still in the first chapter, verse 21. Forces that would bring death and disease have taken hold of a man Yet they recognize Jesus and they know what his power means for them. Jesus commands these forces to leave and people are amazed at his authority. Now, I want to point out to you, the Greek from which we get this gospel is crystal clear. These are um, representatives of these forces and so forth alluded to in the inter introduction. But they are actual personality beings called demons, evil spirits, and so forth. They are the minions of the Satan. And uh, one of the things that I want to challenge all of my super educated, gregarious, socially minded, blah, 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 people is read the scriptures, okay? So here we are, verse 21. He's called Peter James John and Andrew and presumably other disciples. And as they went into Capernaum, now Capernaum is a village that Jesus was based out of. Um, and it is an actual place and you can go there and see the archeology span and all that other kind of stuff. And immediately on the Sabbath, which is Friday at sundown, Saturday at sundown. There's a service at the beginning of the Sabbath. There's a service on Saturday morning. There's a service at the end of the Sabbath. But on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. Okay, so the synagogue was a gathering place of Jews that developed during the Babylonian captivity and uh, became very popular. So the local community life of the Jewish community at this time was in the synagogue 
even though there was a temple in Jerusalem. And it seemed to be that the Jerusalem temple was an ongoing operation in and of itself, that the average Jew would go up to Jerusalem three times a year for the three great pilgrim festivals. And the rest of the time they were home and they were trying to run their businesses and feed their families and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So the synagogue is the local place of gathering. It's so important that there's a custom in Judaism that says if you have 10 Jews that move into an area, the first thing they do before they even build their houses is to build a synagogue. All right. So. And 10 comes from Abraham trying to talk God out of doing any harm to Sodom in order to save his nephew Lot. 10 is called a minion. It's a quorum. It's necessary uh, in the Jewish community to have a worship service. So Jesus goes to the synagogue in Capernaum, which is a fishing village on the, on the lake of Gennesaret, sometimes called the Sea of Galilee. And he was teaching. So what you have here, um, they don't have clergy like we do. You know, we, we have a custom among Lutheran congregations that there is a properly called pastor who will lead the worship, preach, and teach. It's primary function and nobody else. So you can't bring uh, your your nephew who's, you know, like a Seventh-day Adventist pastor in and say, he's preaching today instead of Pastor Weitzel. I'm in a special setting as an intentional interim, but I'm the guy. It's my job to lead the worship, to preach, and to teach. And the way we've got it set up among ourselves is nobody else does that, or baptisms, or weddings, or funerals, uh, unless... I invite them. That's the way we've set up our faith community. So in the synagogue, it, it's more relaxed. There's a president of the congregation like Jim, uh, uh, Dr. Jensen is for us, um, but they kind of coordinate the community life. And uh, the principal act of worship in Judaism is the study of the Torah and so Jesus has a reputation. He's connected to this community. He's invited in. And the way it works is to get the expensive scrolls out of the cabinet called the Ark. They put them on the table. They roll out to the assigned lessons for the day. They're read out loud. And then the sermon comes from the translation and explanation of the Hebrew scriptures to the people who speak Aramaic. We're familiar with this. Like, for example, it used to be the Catholics would do everything in Latin as the official worship in the reading. And then somebody had to bring it out of Latin into whatever the local language was to enhance the people's understanding. Uh, so there's like a sacred language. Uh, Hebrew was a sacred language at this point in time, uh, but connected pretty profoundly to the Aramaic. And the Koine Greek, of course, was a new thing that was added when Alexander came through. But Jesus is teaching. So immediately, 54 times in Mark, you'll hear it immediately, there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So what's going on here is interesting. In the spiritual realm, Jesus is known. Okay, they know exactly who he is. We don't. Human beings are kind of like, duh. He's sent to us and we just can't see it. So uh, we're looking at Jesus and not sure who he is or what he's about and trying to piece together, okay, what am I seeing here? What's he saying? What's he doing? What's it mean? And we're trying to kind of pull the pieces of a big jigsaw puzzle together in order to figure out what's going on here. And interestingly, the demons, the evil spirits, they already know who he is. 
So there are these exorcisms, and apparently there are four in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus casts out evil spirits. And in two of those stories, he has a conversation with the evil spirits. And it's rather, um, you know, I, I'm working in the medieval period with, you know, kings and dukes and, you know, the grand master and all that sort of stuff. Um, there, there's this sense of a functioning, ruling and reigning authority. They know who Jesus is and they know who they are and they're afraid. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Um, have you come to destroy us? That's a really interesting question because we're into gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and yet these horrific beings that can possess a human being and drive them from being the image and likeness of God down into this hellish existence, they're afraid of him. And we ought to be asking, Why? So um, what kind of power does Jesus have? And there are these little hints that come out in the scriptures. One of them is people are, you know, the disciples, the apostles and the disciples want Jesus to come in and wipe out the, the bad guys in the moment. And he says to them, don't you think if I wanted to, that I couldn't call on like 12 legions of angels that would immediately come to my rescue. So in the Roman world, a legion, uh, there was only, you know, a couple of dozen legions worldwide. And Jesus's personal bodyguard of angels is numbered in 12 legions, uh, you know, 1,000, 1,500 warriors each with all the, you know, the catapults and you know, all that sort of the cavalry and, and so forth. You get this impression of overwhelming military power at Jesus's beck and call, and he's choosing not to use it. Um, and we see a Jew, uh, you know, archaeologists think that male Palestinian Jews in the first century, second temple time period would have been about, Five nine, they would have weighed around 170 to 185 pounds. Um, that they would have been olive skin, dark hair, dark eyes. They had good teeth because they didn't eat sugar. It's an interesting kind of thing. Jesus comes up from a working class family. His father is what they call a tecton, is like a general construction worker. Uh, we have a guy that comes to help us at the farm named Al. And he can paint, he can do carpentry, he can do masonry, he can farm. There's nothing that Al can't do, you know. And he's got these tough hands. He's uh, real skinny because he gets too busy to eat. And he's always working with his hands. And he's um, in the uh, scriptures that interpret the, the, the Torah, <coughs> it says if you have this theological problem and there aren't any rabbis or scribes around or anything, <clears throat> ask a carpenter because they're used to making things work out, fit together and so forth. So that's who we see when we see Jesus of Nazareth. And yet these spirits that are contrary to God, that are working for the destruction of God's good creation and the diminishment and death of human beings, they find when Jesus walks in into the room, they're terrified. Um, I was in grad school at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois, kind of the evangelical Harvard. And there were a lot of foreign students. And there was one guy from Central Africa. And um, uh, I was, the, the army sent me there. So most of the time I was in civilian clothes but um, there was an event with the ROTC department on campus, and they asked me to come to it. So I wore my uniform that day. And when I walked into the room in uniform, these African students were really upset. They did not know that I was in the U.S. Army, 
And in their country, people in the army were to be feared. And so they were like, oh my God, this guy's an army officer and we've been hanging around. Did we say anything or do anything? And then there was, you know, it was a double session class. So we had a break in the middle. And when I came back into the classroom, I'm coming in off the hallway into the door and this guy's uh, going out the door and we kind of bumped shoulders in the doorway. He threw himself up against the wall and was apologizing. He was afraid and it took me a little while to calm him down. Uh, but it was because in his culture, uh, you didn't mess with anybody in the army. So he was upset that I was in the army and he didn't know it. And then he bumped into me, which was a big sin in his culture and not in ours. You know, it's like we're public servants. We get treated as the army, um, like the general population. Is, Yo, dude, you work for me. It's not that way all over the world. So I, I kind of get an insight into this text from that. So um, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Okay, so a couple of key words here in verse 25. But Jesus rebuked him. Now, this word rebuke goes all the way back to uh, Genesis, to the creation where God rebukes the chaos and imposes his order. It is um, present in Moses rebuking the sea and it divides so the children of Israel can go through dry shod. Uh, one of the prophets uh, rebukes Satan. It's a, a word of authority. If you are an authority figure, you have the ability to stop, do this, and it's done, and God has that authority, okay? He is the, the creator, and when God says, stop it, do this, it's done. There's no questions asked about it, so it's uh, pretty rare <laughs> in the culture of the United States. There isn't anybody that has that kind of authority, you know, it's like, uh, we just got through a run with the president of the United States, who's supposed to be the most powerful man in the free world. And look how he got <clears throat> treated by our own media. So um, the uh, Jesus rebukes this unclean spirit and says to him, be silent, kind of like shut up and come out of him. And he shuts up. And he leaves. And the unclean spirit convulsed him, crying out in a loud voice, and he came out of him. Now look at the reaction in verses 27 and 28. And everybody there was amazed. Amazed. It's like, what the heck is going on here? And they questioned among themselves, what is this? This is a new teaching. He's up here expounding Torah to us. This unclean spirit event happens. He cuts it off, ends it. And they're like, our people don't teach like this. The scribes and the Pharisees and so forth, they're always quoting all these other rabbis and all these authorities. And the text says this and cross-reference to here and so forth. And this guy, you know, he can do all of that, but he just acts straight out of himself on his own recognizance without having to appeal to any other authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. This is an epiphany question. Who is this guy? And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. So Galilee is kind of like a county size entity, the Sea of Galilee. One of the biblical commentators was pointing out that um, it's not a sea. It, it's a lake. In Pennsylvania, it's a pond from, you know, like one to 10 acres. Anything above 10 acres is a lake. 
and the Sea of Galilee is a lake by the Pennsylvania Game Commission standards. And 